asked to come and talk to you specifically about what kind of uh, threats we're seeing in Lake Champlain relative to aquatic invasives, so that's going to be plants, animals, and pathogens. Um, to give you a little overview of the Lake Champlain Basin, if you're not as familiar, the red outline there, we share our watershed with New York, Vermont, and Quebec. So we're an interstate and international um, watershed, and that poses some unique challenges with different jurisdictions, management between the states and the province of Quebec. As many of you know, Lake Champlain drains to the north through the Richelieu River into the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, my organization, the Lake Champlain Basin Program, is a little bit of a complicated one to understand. We're a federally designated organization, and what that means is the governor of New York, the governor of Vermont, and the premier of Quebec all got together and said, we'd like one organization dedicated to coordinating management amongst federal, state, and local partners to improve the water quality, the longevity, of the health of the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, so it took an act of Congress to create us. Um, we get most of our funding through the EPA. We do get some money through the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. Um, we have some money from the National Park Service and from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well. Um, this is our updated map. I know Aaron just showed this one, but this is the one I always kick off on um, to re-emphasize what you've already heard today, which is there's a lot to protect in that area between Lake Ontario, north of Erie Canal, south of the St. Lawrence Seaway, west of Lake Champlain. Uh, there are a lot of existing pressures out there. The organisms that are known to occur in the Hudson that are non-native invasive are now documented at 122, and those are the ones that are known. Um, Overlapping species also exist, exist in the Great Lakes, last documented known at 184. You can read the numbers for the St. Lawrence River. Um, and in Lake Champlain, we have 50. Lake Champlain is a source of invasive species for overland transport inland to water bodies in the Adirondack Park um, and Vermont that we're really looking to protect. Um, we've worked with a number of other partners to look at the number of invasives that have come in over the decades just to show folks um, the history and this expands from pre-1920 when we didn't really know exactly when some of these came in um, all the way through today and in the last decade period between 2010 and 2014 our last new invasive has been the spiny water fleet which was discovered this past summer. Um, the top aquatic invasive species we're fighting in Lake Champlain right now include water chestnut, um, Eurasian water milfoil, and in the last few, leaf, a few years, variable leaf milfoil as well. Um, alewife, uh, we've got some interesting information coming out from work from our partners on alewife in Lake Champlain. Asian clam in Lake George and the Champlain Canal, um, both of which have direct connection to Lake Champlain. We expect to find them in Lake Champlain at some point in time. Um, zebra mussels and no quagga mussels is not there. We do not have a known population of quagga mussels in Lake Champlain yet. Um, that's really significant because we have a lot of historical shipwrecks, um, water intakes, um, a lot of things that we're trying to preserve um, where zebra mussels do not reach. And quagga mussels came in because they occupy deeper waters and actually reproduce <coughs> frequently. Um, it could further uh, damage the, the food web within Lake Champlain. Um, and spiny water flea is our new invader. So I'm going to take you to the southern end of Lake Champlain on a sunny day in August. <laughs> um, and this is our putting green of water chestnut in the South Lake. And uh, it's, it's, it has been bank to bank in the past. Um, water chestnut is an annual plant. It floats, drops these seeds. The seeds on the right are dry and they're, they're quite pokey. You have to be careful with your fingers. Um, but there's been a very, for decades, we've been working with partners to mechanically harvest very dense populations of water chestnut in the South Lake. That's an aerial view of uh, mechanically harvesting water chestnut in Lake Champlain. Where densities are less than 25% and in waters that are too shallow to access by mechanical harvester, we have contracted crews that go out and hand pull um, water chestnut out of the backwaters in Lake Champlain. And management of water chestnut has been directly correlated with the amount of funding available to manage water chestnut. Um, as you can see, we're showing a spread of years here between 1999 on the left-hand Lake Champlain diagram, uh, 2007, and then 2014. And what you see is water chestnut in less than 25% populations had extended all the way up to about the Crown Point level. Folks know the bridge that crosses between Vermont and New York. 
Um, and that population, so the red represents where we're mechanically harvesting in 1999, and you can see that that has greatly um, moved to the south with the resources that we put. And now we're south of the um, Dresden Narrows in Lake Champlain, and all of the yellow part is what we're still surveying and hand harvesting. So it's a really great success story. There have been a few remote populations that have popped up in the northern end of the lake that are aggressively managed, um, both by Quebec and Mississippi National Wildlife Refuge, along with other state partners. So that's to give you an idea of what we're doing with water chestnut in Lake Champlain. And the goal is in another five to seven years to be completed with the mechanical harvesting and to switch all over into surveying and hand folding in Lake Champlain. Um, Eurasian water milfoil, and unfortunately recently variable leaf milfoil, um, are present in Lake Champlain. We have a very small population of variable leaf that was discovered in 2011 up near the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge and another population that was found further south in the south end of the lake. Um, there are a number of different control mechanisms that we use for Eurasian and variable leaf, none of which are used in Lake Champlain. The population spreads from north to south. Um, we are not managing this population in Lake Champlain, but we are managing populations of both variable and Eurasian in inland water bodies throughout the park and in Vermont. And you can see we're using chemicals, chemical barrier mats, suction harvesting, and hand pulling to do that. I wanted to give you a quick example in 2011 when very relief was found in the South Lake. Um, our, we have a rapid response task force that uh, is made up of partners in the basin. I'll talk about in a minute, but when we went out to survey for variable release, we found it over an 80 acre area and different types of densities throughout that area, at which point it's too large to control. It's not technically feasible and financially feasible to control this population. So in this rapid response case, we said we had to move to spread prevention um, and really redouble our efforts on both launch stewardship and um, other transport mechanisms on other equipment. Alewife um, are not new. They've been around, and there was a population known to be in Lake St. Catherine um, in 1997. <coughs> Sean Good gave a presentation earlier today. I can tell you long stories about alewife um, in Vermont, Lake St. Catherine. That population seems to have been um, relatively contained. Lake St. Catherine does drain into Lake Champlain. However, the first populations we found in Lake Champlain were in the northern end of the lake in Quebec. Um, in Vermont between 2002, three, four, we started picking up alewife. Um, many of you may be familiar with the huge die-offs in the Great Lakes. We are seeing die-offs in Lake Champlain. Um, you can see some of them occurring under the ice. Some of them are more frequently in the spring, but we have nothing to the extent that's been observed in the Great Lakes. It's a nuisance. Um, it doesn't smell good when these fish wash up on shore. It's a little alarming to the public. So um, we have to do a little bit of explanation there. And do just some really great work by Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We've started to look at the dynamics between smelt and alewife in Lake Champlain. And unfortunately, now that we've had them in the lake for over a decade, we're starting to see shifts in the smelt population. So they're directly competing with smelt. Um, smelt was probably the preferred meal choice of the Salmonids in Lake Champlain. Now because alewife are so um, uh, so abundant, Salmonids are eating the alewife in greater numbers. And there has been a problem in a percentage of the Salmonids that there is a vitamin B uptake issue into their eggs. So a lot of the hatcheries that stock Salmonids have had to bathe the alewife, uh, excuse me, the Salmonid eggs in vitamin B to make them viable for stocking in Lake Champlain. So that's a, that's a sort of secondary impact of the ill life in Lake Champlain that has to be managed. So in most places we're seeing smelt populations are decreasing in certain areas of the lake. In some areas we've seen a slight increase in, around Barber Point, but um, on the whole in the north, northern end of the lake, we're starting to see that smelt are really being outcompeted by ill life. There's the Asian clam. Um, they're really quite a unique Clam, and they are not documented in Lake Champlain, but are in Lake George and the Champlain Canal. And they're not a new critter to the United States of America. Um, they were first found in 1994 on the west coast in Washington State. 
Um, and they really spread south and east and then started creeping north again. And I think there's been a lot more alarm about Asian clam, particularly in this region, because the lake that they invaded is one of our queen jewels, Lake George. And Lake George is a very pristine lake and it's on the northern range of the known or documented temperature tolerance of this corbiculous luminea of Asian clam. What's interesting is in some of the other locations that are for as north as well, most of those populations are surviving in warm water effluence from um, electric, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, from power plants, power plants, thank you. Uh, <laughs> So um, this was a little bit shocking, but more shocking yet was that Lake Tahoe has been fighting Asian clam and what they've been seeing going on in Lake Tahoe and some of our partners in Ireland, what they've been seeing there um, had led to consequences that Lake George wasn't willing to accept. And I'll show you a few photographs of that. But Asian clam are, um, they're a little bugger because they're hermaphrodites. So it only takes one. Um, it's pretty easy to dis distinguish them from our native species because they have these concentric ridges which you can click your fingernail over and they look nothing like our native mussels or snails. Um, they grow very quickly. They siphon both with a pedal foot and through their, um, their other siphon for food. Um, and they tend to really like sandy areas and Lake George has a number of sandy areas. Luckily it also has a lot of hard bedrock areas where Asian clam are not doing well. Um, but they reproduce quickly and when we got in touch with Lake Tahoe, their observations were that they were starting to see some green algal bloom masses forming over dense beds of Asian clam. The direct link has not been officially proven, um, but it is likely that the Asian clam shells are making nutrients more bioavailable in the water column, um, helping to fuel some of these little algal blooms along the shorelines in Lake Tahoe. So this is Lake Tahoe, not Lake George. But when Lake George saw these photographs, they said, nah, -uh, not in our lake, no way, no how. Um, so we started to get involved with managing um, Asian clam in Lake George. And earlier there was a question about what other control techniques were um, attempted. There were some flow through models that New York DEC did using Bailicide, which is a chemical used for lamprey, um, specifically used in delta areas. And the Asian clams were able to bury themselves in the sediment and close up for over a three week period, and we submerged once the trial was over, but they were fine. <laughs> um, so we decided that even though there was one chemical that we thought we might be able to use in New York State to treat Asian clam, we thought it might be Bailicide, and it wasn't working. So that was, that was unfortunate. We looked at benthic barrier mats. We did look at some heat treatments. We did attempt a dredging operation, a suction harvest operation for Asian clams. But that operation actually helped spread them more than suck them all up. Um, so the other concerns are that if the beds of Asian clams get too dense, that they could provide breeding grounds for other species like zebra mussels, which we're trying to and have been really well managed in Lake George. So we're trying to them there. So originally we only had one population of Asian clam show up down in this area, um, and then, so we started treating them with, this photograph is showing benthic barrier mats that are going out into the, into about 10 feet of water, overlapping. I mean, this is a great summer workout if you wanna move sandbags and a lot of rebar. We were really successful at killing the Asian clams and suffocating them underneath the mats. However, um, what we've learned over the years is that we're not good at detecting the juvenile stage of Asian clam, and that's likely why they have been spread to other areas of the lake, because annually the Lake George Park Commission and other partners in Lake George coordinate an annual survey of the areas that we think Asian clam might show up in. And you survey them one, one year or one season and you don't find anything, you survey them the next season and you find adults, so we're missing them at the juvenile stage. So that's. That's something we gotta focus on is looking at the at the juvenile stage. But right now they've switched over into more of a long-term management program for trying to keep dense populations away from the marinas and other areas where boats anchor. As Aaron said earlier, that's a transport mechanism that they're concerned about moving the Asian clam around within the lake. 
If you want more information, there's a website, there's a hotline. You can go get all the information you want about Asian clam management in Lake George. Zebra mussels are a huge species of concern in Lake Champlain. Again, we're not doing anything to manage the species. It came in from the south through the Champlain Canal. It spread north over time. I probably don't need to tell you the whole story about zebra mussels, um, but they reproduce frequently in large numbers. Um, we do take samples in all of our um, water bodies that we suspect they might show up in, in inland waters in Vermont, um, in some waters in New York. We're looking for villagers. It's surprising to me that they haven't spread further, frankly, because the water quality limiting factor for most of the zebra mussels is thought to be calcium. Um, and we have many lakes that would support zebra mussels in Vermont for calcium levels. And we just haven't seen them colonizing. And the story is most invasions fail. That's the biology of invasion. So maybe they just have attempted a few times and haven't quite gotten a foothold yet. Or maybe um, we're starting to catch up with our outreach and education and spread prevention methods. This is just to show you how quickly they spread coming in from the south end, the gray, uh, between 93 and 95, they come all the way up through the main lake. And you can see even in Missisquai Bay, which is a very shallow, sandy area where we wouldn't think super mussels would find something hard to attach to, they are growing on top of each other um, in the shallows of Missisquai Bay. Not in as great numbers as you see in other parts of the lake, but in a decade they had spread throughout the entire, the entire lake. Um, <clears throat> So identification of zebra mussels is a little tricky. Um, we are so concerned about quagga mussels right now that anything that we see that we have a question mark about will pick up and we'll start talking to folks like Dr. Ellen Larson and other, other partners who are here um, about identifying because um, I think that the quagga mussel is on its way in, in systems that are connected to Lake Champlain and that poses a greater threat to the waters of the Adirondack Park and uh, the inland waters of Vermont. So spiny water flea. This one was sort of on the radar, but it showed up sort of making a huge leap from the Great Lakes into inland waters in the Adirondack Park. And um, as you can see, it's a, it's a small crustacean. Um, this line here is covered with a few hundred um, spiny water flea, and they do clog down rivers, and they're a pain to anglers, and um, <coughs> technology has evolved, and now they develop different types of lines and downriggers so that spiny water flea can't hook on them as easily. Um, but basically, like most invasives, they reproduce um, quickly. They can reproduce sexually and asexually. Um, and they tend, their population really took off in Lake Champlain. It was very shocking this past summer. Um, we detected them for the first time in Lake Champlain um, so here, sorry, this is from 2012, so where, they're, where they were known to occur, and in two short years they've come in and we found them in various lakes in this area of, um, of the region as well as up into Lake Champlain. And uh, the, sh the shocking thing is we run a long-term monitoring pro program on Lake Champlain, and we thought that anglers would find them first because they're out there, they're on the front lines, they're out there every day. Um, <coughs> Our long-term monitoring program found them for the first time and we found one per net toe in four toes in the main lake in, Ju in July. And then in August, we were finding up to 500 specimens per toe. So their population just exploded. And maybe they were in Lake Champlain and we didn't detect them the year before, or maybe the conditions just changed and made it just right that they totally exploded in August and all of a sudden we had a huge population and a lot of um, public education going out about spiny water flea. We've talked to a lot of researchers and we've really found the best way to prevent the spread of the resting age of the uh, resting egg stage as well as the adults of spiny water flea is desiccation. Um, and so one of our recommendations for spread prevention is really in that clean drain dry focusing on the drying method for spiny water flea um, for 12 to 24 hours after contact with water known to so I don't have enough time in 20 minutes to go over all of the things that were, we expect are on their way. You've heard from a number of them. I'm very grateful that Phil went over a lot of the laws and regulations that exist in the state, and Aaron touched on a few of the ones that are coming. Um, 
as you're well aware, in the national news, there's been a lot of you know, concern about this Chicago Sanitary Ship Canal. It's very relevant to us in New York. Um, if the species got into the Great Lakes, that, that would be very concerning right now. They're the largest biomass in Mississippi drainage, which is shocking, as many of you know. Um, a lot of regulations that Phil talked about are out there to prevent the spread of viral hemorrhagic septicemia with the bait fish regulations. Round goby are unfortunately in the St. Lawrence Seaway coming down the, um, you know, the Chambly Canal. They're also moving west, um, from west to east in the Erie Canal. I think eventually they're going to be in Lake Champlain if we don't stop them. The Hydrilla Pilla, we call it, um, is of great concern. And the Army Corps of Engineers has been doing some really excellent research on hydrilla. And for those of you who aren't aware, we have Monetius hydrilla in the Northeast. Um, it's very different from the phenology of dioecious hydrilla, which exists in the Southeast, where they control it mostly by chemicals. And that technology or the, that, that tool in our toolbox is not readily permitted and accepted for use um, in New England. We do have success stories with hydrilla in states like Maine, where they've treated hydrilla for eight to 10 consecutive years and then have found no, no detections in two to three consecutive years after that. It is possible to control it if you get it early, but it's a long-term commitment, a lot of resources. And Phil also t uh, touched on snakehead, which was found in Catlin Creek and Creamery Pond. <coughs> And your DEC and other partners were able to eradicate it from that location, which is a really great success story. Quagga mussels really scare me. Um, we have intercepted them with boat launch stewards on the bottoms of boats and other equipment coming into the lake of uh, waters of the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, I'm just surprised we haven't found them yet and we haven't detected them anywhere, but I'm concerned. We know that most of the species that arrive to Lake Champlain are coming in through the canal system. Um, there are other ways that they move across the landscape, but <coughs> the canal may seem to be the largest open pathway connecting um, watersheds that would otherwise be separated. Um, and a number of partners, including University of Vermont, um, Dr. Ellen Morrison, and New York Sea Grant have been working on for decades, can we filter biological traffic in the Champlain Canal or other canal ways? And with the Asian carp in the news, um, I think there's been a refocus on looking at the Erie Canal, which connects, you know, Hydrilla into the Champlain um, Canal, possibly around gobies in the system, quagga mussels are in the system. Um, equally, we have organisms that exist in the Lake Champlain Basin that aren't native to other regions, so it goes both ways. We don't want our species going into other watersheds, and we don't want other uh, watershed species coming into the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, the Lake Champlain Basin Program, my organization, has organized and approved the Lake Champlain Aquatic Invasive Species Management Plan for rapid response. Um, and it designated a rapid response task force, a number of which the members of the task force are sitting in this room. Um, we have representatives from my organization. I coordinate this task force. Bill Ardren is the chair from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Sean Good sits on this rapid response task force from Vermont East. Of Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, Lance Durfee is here from New York State DEC. We have, I don't know if Ed Sneezek is here from Adirondack Park Agency. We also have the Quebec Ministry of Environment on our task force. So this is a small group of committed people that respond when the phone rings, as it did on the 4th of July week, a few years ago when some water cleaver found in Lake George. And we're tasked with getting together in 48 to 72 hours to address the situation. To go out and confirm the species is what we think it is, to look a little bit more about how extensive the population might be, um, to conduct a species risk assessment to determine if it's technically feasible to do anything about it, um, and to come up with some recommendations. So that's a task force that we're, we're working on to help manage some of these new organisms. And if we're addressing species that either spread from one water body into a new water body in the basin, or the arrival of a new species. So these were the photos of spiny water flea in the Champlain Canal earlier in 2012. Um, one of the recommendations of the task force, which was a project that already had been spearheaded a little while ago, was to look at um, a feasibility study for a barrier on the Champlain Canal. 
and we've partnered with the Canal Corporation, New York DC, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and a number of others. And we're finally at a place where we have stewards on the canal system at the launches. New York State um, Canal Corporation is looking at redirecting the flow of water in the Champlain Canal so that the water that drains uh, north and downhill into Lake Champlain comes only from the source of Lake Champlain and that the water that comes into the height of the Champlain Canal, canal from the Hudson drains downhill and south back into the Hudson. We also know that Overland Transport is a very significant pathway. It's been proven in the literature. We're concerned about all these bait, bait wells, live wells. We have a boat launch steward program. We also know from the literature that it's effective to remove plants um, with stewards, but if you're dealing with small-bodied organisms, it's really important to start looking at high water, hot pressure um, decontamination. Our steward program on Lake Champlain only covers the busiest launches at DRTC and Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife on the lake. We collect a lot of data. We started using tablets to collect that data. Um, we've talked to uh, over 14,000 boats this past summer, interacted with 31,000 visitors, and we found on the whole that 7.5% of all of the boats that were moving, either launching or retrieving from Lake Champlain had confirmed invasive species on them. So while that's a threat, it's only a small portion of the visitors. And so if you can focus your efforts just on that small group of high-risk vessels, I think we can greatly reduce the spread. And 83% of our visitors are documented to be taking spread prevention measures already to Lake Champlain. I only have two more slides here. So here, I wanted to graphically show you that overland transport on boats and trailers to Lake Champlain within a two-week period of time happens a lot because of our bass fishing tournaments in particular. There's other types of fishing tournaments on Lake Champlain, but we attract folks from all over the country in very short periods of time, trailering their vessels and equipment and coming and launching in Lake Champlain. Um, so this really emphasizes the need for stewardship and to look at strategic boat launch and decontamination. This is just a map of what Aaron was talking about earlier where we collaborated with all of our boat launch steward data and we started to identify the highest risk water bodies for transport of invasive species. This is really exciting because for the first time we're taking our data, we're linking it with the literature, and we're putting it on a map to show us where we can focus our resources. And that's a project that Phil talked about earlier about coordinating with New York DEC to get a strategic park-wide plan for boat inspection and decontamination. So I'll, I'll just round it out that you know there are a lot of folks working on all of this work, one plan at a time, one species at a time. Um, it's a huge team effort, but I think that we're really starting to see behavior change from the folks who use our resources. And if we can be consistent with messaging about clean, drain, and dry, um, I think they can prevent and slow down the spread of the